This clip is brought to you by SaveWithConrad.com. Ray Stevens has been uh, noted by Ric Flair as being his favorite wrestler growing up. And I think a lot of our younger listeners may not realize that before Pat Patterson was the first intercontinental champion from that prestigious tournament down in Rio de Janeiro, he was arguably one half of the greatest tag team of all time and not a ton of footage out there of that tag team, but folks who actually got to live it and see it said it was unlike anything else. And as with a lot of other things in wrestling, uh, it was probably a, a bit ahead of its time. I think Roy Shire, the promoter that I had so much affection for was critical of the style. They would work that they did maybe too many big moves, maybe work too fast, maybe had too many false finishes, but it was a, a, a breath of fresh air. By the way, we hear all that same stuff about tag teams these days too. It's just constantly evolving, but Pat was a big time innovator for tag team wrestling before he was intercontinental champ, right? Yeah. Pat was, you know, Pat made it in this business, um, by being, you know, being better, frankly, than, than everyone else's peers around him. And Patrick was able to, to find his way. You know, he, he started out as a kid. Pat wanted to be in the circus. And as a kid, he would study the circus and he, he always wanted to be a trapeze artist and, and walk the high wire and, and shit like that. So that was Pat's dream as a child. When he was very young, <coughs> I, I think that, uh, he started watching wrestling would hang around the, the old Montreal arena and the Maple Leaf gardens at the time. And try to carry wrestlers' bags in, try to do whatever it is he could to sneak in because it wasn't a really wealthy family by any stretch of the imagination. So Pat would do whatever he could to, to try and get in and watch the wrestling matches. And he fell in love. That was what that was what he wanted to do. Yeah, Bruce, when all this happened, uh I went back and I watched Pat's Hall of Fame speech from when he went in the Hall of Fame. And man, he put over killer Kowalski so huge. And I had no idea that that was somebody that, that Pat looked up to. And, uh, he talked about, you know, being so excited to get his autograph. And even years later, all these years later, now when Pat himself was going in the hall of fame, he still had that photo that Walter had signed for him all those years before. That's pretty remarkable and shows you, you know, how deep his fandom went. I mean, he wanted to do this his whole life. Yeah. And the thing about it is, is that when you, you know, you look at it and you say his fandom, it was, it was his love. And Pat really fell in love with wrestling and got fixated on wrestling, much like he did the circus and would accept no substitute. Got on a bus, man, took all the money he had, which wasn't a lot. Uh, I think it was in the teens of dollars, like $16, something like that. And got on a bus from Montreal and landed in Boston, Massachusetts. So Pat did not speak English. He's got 17 bucks. Doesn't know a soul in Boston finds a place to stay near where the promoter's office was, Tony Santos. And basically, you know, told Tony Santos he wanted to be a wrestler and, and that he he wanted to, to learn how to wrestle and he was going to wrestle and so on and so forth. And as is the story with a lot of guys, old timers, that there was that one moment where you have an opportunity and you step into the ring and you, you never get out of the ring from that point going forward. And so they, Tony Santos gave him a break. Tony, um, let Pat wrestle one point, didn't have enough guys from there. Pat got a, a little, a room, um, 
in, in someone's house or like in this apartment building. It was a weird deal. And Pat would tell stories about even as a young kid living in this, this apartment thing that was owned by an old man that used to sit down at the bottom of the steps to collect everybody's rent for the week and, and how Pat would just torture this guy, dropping water balloons on him and, and whatever he could to, to just laugh and, and have fun and order, you know, order food to be delivered for the old man. It's, I didn't order this. And then Pat would eat it. Um, the old man would pay for it because, you know, back in those days, someone orders food, you got to, somebody's got to pay for it. And it just, Pat at a very early age had a sense of humor that if Pat was going to do it, he was going to have fun with it. No matter what it was, Pat was going to have fun and love to laugh and love to love to laugh at a lot of times other people's misery, which is probably where I got that. My sixth sense of humor. Well, let's, um, let's mention right at the top that normally when we do a deep dive bio on a talent like this, we would come with, uh, a lot of facts and a lot of details about their whole life. And we're still going to do that someday on Pat Patterson. Uh, but that day won't be today. Today, we're just going to let Bruce tell some stories and sort of speak from the heart. Now, I have 46 pages of notes ready to go on Pat Patterson when we do the full profile show. But I thought today uh, on the heels of, uh, all of this news being so fresh, maybe what would be best would be if we just sort of let you tell your story. So tell us about the first time you got to meet Pat Patterson. Well, the first time that I met Pat officially was in 1987, shortly after WrestleMania, the uh, office in Houston, Paul Bosch's wrestling office, which was partially owned by Bill Watts in Mid South at the time. We had Watts had sold his territory, the UWF, to um, Jim Crockett Promotions. And Paul Bosch didn't want to be any part of that. Paul didn't didn't like Jim Crockett. And I don't want to say he didn't like him. Didn't know Jim Crockett. Put it that way. Didn't know Jim Crockett, but knew enough about him that he knew he did not wish to do business with him. Paul was willing to open up and try, but his his phone calls and attempts to get a hold of Crockett went unanswered. So Paul called his old friend Jim Barnett. A meeting was arranged for Pat, Vince, and Jim Barnett to jump on a plane to come to Houston to meet with Paul. So that was the first time uh, on that day that I actually ever you know met Pat, shook his hand, and, and got to talk to him for a few seconds. But, uh, you know, through the years, you hear an awful lot of things about people. I, I remember the first time that I ever saw Pat, and th that was in, a, uh, wasn't in Amarillo, it was in El Paso, Texas, seen him on TV. And Pat did a character, Lord Patrick Patterson, because Pat's English wasn't good. So... Pat would cut these promos from uh, in a lawn chair and talk about, hey, all you farmers out there in Texas. And he would just do it through his thick French-Canadian accent trying to be British. And it was the drizzling fucking shits. But goddamn, man, when Pat got in the ring and turned it on, no one could touch his work. So I saw Pat first as a very, you know, young kid uh, watching wrestling, just being a fan of wrestling. Then he came and uh, I think he did one or two shots maybe in Houston for Paul Bosch uh, with Ray Stevens as his partner. And holy shit, they were just, I don't know how to explain it because their work was just that good. You knew it. You knew it when you watched them, that this was something special, that these two guys were the best there was. 
Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And go save yourself some money right now. If you're in a 30-year loan or you have credit card debt, it's not a matter of if I can save you money. It's a matter of how much. Find out right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com.